Good morning, everyone. So today we're talking about you attest and H2 cyber. We're going to do a webinar regarding virtual CISOs and identity governance. So today we have Paul Horn with us. Paul is the founder and CEO of H2 cyber. He's the former chief information security officer. He's also a cybersecurity expert. You can read through his clarifications below. Also a former special agent with the Air Force Office of Special Investigations. We also have Garrett Grajek. He's our CEO here at UATEX. Uh, he has 25 plus years of IT security product creation. He's the author and co-author of 15 US patents for information security products. The focus being application SSO, two-factor authentication, identity assurance, continuous authentication, AI, and blockchain. So far, he's created companies and products from scratch, the co-founder and inventor of the product for the SecureAuth Corporation. He's created revolutionary products inside of other enterprises, such as Silence, which is now BlackBerry. He's taking existing technology and invigorating with new leadership and enterprise thought. So right now his focus is UATest, which is an application SSO based IGA tool. The agenda for today, I've already gone over the introductions. We're gonna talk about what is a VCSO and why are they so popular today? What are the tasks of the VCSO? What is identity governance? The VCSO and how it relates to identity governance. We're also gonna do a live demo with a UATest overview and then of course a Q&A at the end of the session. I'm gonna pass it over to Paul Horn and he's gonna talk about what the VCSO is today. All right, hello everybody. Well, first off, thanks to Garrett and the UATS team for having me. Uh, so, you know, a CISO, what is a CISO? So a CISO really is just somebody that's highly qualified. Uh, they're an on-demand security practitioner, you know, that's previously either built or ran a cybersecurity program within an organization, you know, most likely an organization with some size and depth. You know, there's, it's not just a sole focus on technology. There's a lot of people in process that sit outside of technology and it traverses your entire business. Every department of your business has some type of play from a cybersecurity perspective. It might just be people in process. It might have no technology related to it, but every part of your, your business does have it to some degree. And, you know, from a CISO's perspective, you know, we have the ability to navigate through all the increasing number of cybersecurity regulation that's out there, whether you're having to abide by CMMC, uh, one of the other flavors of NIST, whether it's 171 or 853, PCI, um, all types of different regulations, because in most cases, a control is a control. And, you know, if you meet a control, you're, you know, you should get credit across all the frameworks uh, from, from that standpoint. And that's really how you should approach your program is to make sure you get credit and are doing the right thing. So almost like harmonizing your uh, regulation out there. So that's really what a CISO is. The other big important thing about a CISO, a VCSO, is it's really an extension extension of your executive leadership team. In most cases, the VCSO is somebody that uh, is brought into the organization because the organization doesn't have somebody uh, appointed internally from a cybersecurity perspective to either lead the program from a strategy standpoint, uh, whether it's in the senior leadership team or the executive leadership team. So really, it's an extension of that team uh, bringing the skills needed for the, for the business. Now, why are VCSOs popular? Well, 
there's a massive uh, short of, shortage of security personnel um, around the globe, and that's traverses you know the, the entry level folks all the way up to the top. Uh, but you know, a full time CISO for a, for any type of company, specifically a small company, you know, that'll typically run them about 380 to 420 from a total comp package per year. And that's a lot to take on from a small firm or a small business perspective. And once you get into the Fortune 500 and global 200, 2000 companies, those comp packages can, can exceed a million plus. So that's why VCSOs are popular because it allows the organization to flex and bring that individual on uh, from an on-demand standpoint without having to come out uh, a massive amount of money to have that person be internal to the organization on a full-time basis. You know, it's extremely difficult for those. And even if the small business really could afford that, it's going to be very difficult because it's extremely difficult for them to compete for talent uh, because the comp packages in most cases are high and, and are going increasing as, as we go forth in time. So it, it's very difficult for them. Now, the one thing I note here is, you know, experience matters, don't be fooled. There's plenty of small and medium-sized businesses that do go out and bring on a security practitioner that's more junior in nature as that person and anoints them the internal CISO or an information security manager. Uh, experience does matter uh, how to navigate that battleground uh, from a cybersecurity perspective, from a strategy, what you're going to do, how you're going to communicate it, uh, budgeting, uh, the ability to look down the road and, and know what works and what's not and what issues are going to happen. And then the other challenge of why CISOs are popular is, you know, even if you do bring somebody on board, the average tenure is only 18 to 26 months. So the likelihood, you know, once they get familiar with your business, they're most likely going to leave due to either the amount of stress or just a high, another higher compensation package from another company that's going to lower them because the demand for security personnel are, is so high. So that's really why they're becoming more popular um, for, for those prime reasons. Now, what are some of the tasks of the VCSO? So I've mentioned before, it's really around strategy and operating at that executive level, but also having the ability to get down in the weeds and know everything from a technical perspective. But really at the end of the day, the VCSO is really there to align that organization um, for, from a cybersecurity perspective, meaning what type of program are we gonna put in place? How are we gonna align it? What standards are we gonna use? bring in all the regulation that we need, have to adhere to, and then make, make that program from that information. You really have to understand risk management from a risk appetite and risk tolerance standpoint uh, in, from the organization to know, hey, where do, what are we willing to do and, and what are we not willing to do and exceed from that standpoint? And then monitor the, the success of the program as you go forth um, from that perspective. You know, in, in most cases, you can increase your score significantly. When I do a review for, for companies of all sizes, you know, we typically build out a three-year roadmap and we can get them to increase their score over the first 18 months by 20 to 30% from their existing score that they're already on. Uh, just knowing how to navigate that complex ecosystem. Now, almost all cybersecurity frameworks call out a host of different things that you need to adhere to. And this is why we're partnering with, with you attest is because one of those areas is around access reviews. You know, whether it's internal to your organization for your employees, your contractors, maybe you're even a B2B business where you're giving access to, you know, folks that are 1099 that are using your platform uh, for your business, your, your affiliates and partnerships. You still have to review that access, not only one, to make sure the right people have the appropriate access, but the roles have the appropriate level of access. And most of those frameworks when you're being audited, whether it be internal or an external firm coming in to audit you, it's more than just having a policy in place that says you do something. You, know, you have to meet the control objective and produce evidence that yes, you do this and it meets that control objective. So, 
that is where we're going to bridge into the UATES platform and how they're able to help in this one little area uh, within the, you know, within the best amount of requirements within all the different cybersecurity regulations and frameworks. Um, and one of those is obviously the access reviews. Next, we're going to transition over to Garrett Grezek regarding identity governance. Garrett, I think you're on mute. Patents don't help with Zoom. <laughs> How are we doing there, guys? Okay. Uh, can you hear me, Ashley and team? Yes. Oh, good. Uh, <laughs> I think I quote my son there. Identity governance defined. Let's talk identity governance. And team, one thing I got to say, it's not bad that off the top of your head, you can't define identity governance. I had like nine of those patents on the IAM side of the house, creating authentication SSO identity products. And if you corn me at lunch or over a coffee or a beer, I couldn't tell you what identity governance was because it's not understood very well. Put up a Gartner one and you can read it yourself. Really the way, the right way to think identity governance is not the what, that's IAM. It's the why. And can you document the why? What I mean by that is identity and access management is, is what it is, right? It's like, oh, I got some repository. That's my uh, uh, directory of truth. And then I, I pushed it out to these resources. And then what I did is I, I, um, I, I created a, a authentication uh, a scheme and then I created a uh, SSO scheme. That's IAM. Identity governance is the, the guy with his fingers on the desk going, okay, afterwards, let me sh show me all your admin accounts, show me your changes in your admin accounts and show me all the roles and show me the first line managers that approve those roles. It's basically tracking what IAM did. Next. So the key parts of I IGA usually fall, in, are, fall under two parts, identity lifecycle management, user provisioning, and access governance, okay? Uh, the reason I bring this up is because most people do have a good understanding of the first one, I, I, basically provisioning, because, you know, let's be blunt, you have an active directory and you have to get it out to your Okta, you have to get it out to your uh, uh, workday, you have to get it out, to, that's your provisioning, okay. What's not understood and what we're going to focus on this one is what access governance, access certification is about. Yeah, we're going to skip over lifecycle management and go to the next one. Access certification. This is what I call the forgotten part of IGA. The forgotten part of, 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 of IGA is straight out after you, you spent all the effort, you got your SSO project product in, you got your a directory, you went to IDAS, which everyone knows you should. Great, you have that working. Okay. Now you rolled out all these roles in, in identities and access rights. You have to review those. I'm not telling you have to review those. As a security person, but maybe virtually I am by the order of NIST 853 revision five and things like PRAC-4 and PRAC-1 that itemize that you should be doing access certification and access rights control, but those that that uh, that guidance has been picked up, copied, mimicked, whatever word you want, in the key certifications. And let's let's lift them off straight out. If you're in retail, PCI DSS says you have to do access reviews, right? If you're in uh, in a mortgage industry, I was just on yesterday with one. You, that's for FFIC and GLB. If you're in healthcare, it's HIPAA High Trust. Guys, look it up if you want to sell to the DOD, okay? And, and it's not like one or two. It's not just, you know, Boeing and Raytheon. It's 300,000 companies that want to do this. And you're now under CMMC or your international ISO 2701. Let's name one more. How about um, going to, um, if, you, if you want uh, HIPAA, high trust, PCI, SOC. SOC, you have to do it as well. You have to 
have a process that shows that you rolled out a mechanism for enterprises, for your entire enterprise, that the people who are responsible for that role are actually granted that role and not too much. That's access certification. Next. So here's what it has to do. You have to review the users, review the roles, review the applications, look at the permissions and what should be done in the right way. And this is the way it's stated in, um, in audit principles like COVID is that you should have the line manager looked at as the normal manager approve, approve that role, but also the application owner. Most people who do this manual never ever do both because it's too complicated. They're just happy enough to just get the line manager to do it, okay? All right, and then the tool, if you're using one, it should be able to delegate out automatically to the line manager and that should be an auto things. And then you should have a concept of revoking the permission or certify. That's what a real access review looks like. And I've itemized why you should do it and I've itemized now what it should be. Let's go. Thanks, Garrett. We're gonna okay. transition back over to Paul and yeah. he's gonna talk about yeah. the VC show today. Yeah, so, you know, in running programs and even serving as a VC, so identity governance is very challenging. And how I see it either in most clients or in even in companies that I've previously worked at when I've gone in is in most cases, it's, it's, a, it's a function either performed by either somebody within IT, somebody within compliance, uh, or if you have a separate identity governance team within your organization. But nonetheless, no matter who's performing it, in almost all cases, whoever that person is that's managing it is doing it via Excel spreadsheets. And there's a lot of Excel spreadsheets. And you couple that with then having to email out all the people, all the managers, following up with them and, and getting the evidence. Hey, I need you to prove I sent this out six weeks ago. You know, follow up emails. Hey, I sent this out five months ago, three, you know, three months all the way down the road. And what that equals to is a massive amount of time, a massive amount of frustration, but most importantly, a ton of errors. Uh, people not getting access terminated or the wrong roles, you know, it just the folks don't understand what it is they're reviewing and improving, and it just leads to a lot of errors because it's a manual process. There's a human involved and we're all gonna make errors just based off of what we're going through in that day. You know, maybe I have a bad day today. Maybe something, maybe I wrecked my car on the way to work or something. And that can lead and, and bridge into identity governance because it's, it's a manual process. So that's what I see typically in most organizations is either the function isn't performed at all. And if it is performed nine times out of 10, it's an Excel spreadsheet then emailed around for, for certification. Hey, I need you to approve, approve this, saving all the emails related to it from an evidence standpoint that yes, Sally did get her access reviewed and Johnny was the one that approved it. And then Johnny also approved the role that she has within the system and things like that. So this is a very challenging uh, thing to accomplish within, a, within an organization from an identity governance standpoint. And I think you attest does a really well job of actually bringing that to a cloud-based system, automating a lot of things, able to evidence and capture a lot of things within the tool. So they're not captured in, a, in an email. You know, people go on vacation. When this is done uh, by an individual that's sent around an email and that person goes on vacation, this thing gets dropped. And, you know, you're, it's, it's not going to drop within the UATest tool because of the automation and things that are built in. So that's all I have to say about it. But uh, I'll turn it back over to, to Garrett and his team. Fantastic. Now Garrett's going to go over you a test and the access certifications. So that list I had prior, that wasn't just something I was like, okay, let me just look up a COVID uh, document and let me uh, just look up in this document and then I'll know exactly what an access review way is done right. No, 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 no. What we did is we took a gentleman uh, like Paul now I know Paul would have, de would have definitely used them. Um, but uh, uh, what I did is I, I, I took people what I call on the left-hand side. Left-hand side is, is you, the guys in IT. That was my life before I started creating companies. Is you're in IT, 
you're told by the compliance department, I'm supposed to do an access review. Well, I got them on the left-hand side, and then I got the people on the right-hand side, which I call the, well, they call the external auditors, right? And I literally just set up sessions that were an hour to two hours long, and we just said, what is it that you on the right-hand side want the person on the left-hand side to do? And, and what is the information that you need to provide? And I, I went through those and review the users, review the roles, review the uh, delegate permissions, all that stuff, okay? But look at this, this column on the right-hand side of this slide. Because what, what I did is to actually make it happen to eliminate the painful process of sending out emails and spreadsheets, I said, okay, what do we do? Well, we need multiple reviewers. We should group the reviewers and we have the product be able to do that. We should be able to collate the reports without having the poor IT guy say, hey, hon, I can't do dinner with the kids. I'm, I'm looking at the spreadsheets till about 11 o'clock tonight. Automate, collate. You should have nag reminders to go out to the first line managers, remind them to do the reviews. You should be able to see the status. You should store it and you should allow notes. Remember, this is IGA. IGA is not just doing. IGA, IGA is showing why you did. Nothing is more important in the process than actually putting some notes on why you granted permission or why the permissions were changed, because that's what the reviewer is looking for. Next. So the product basically is this. The concept is audit ready attestation campaigns right out. You quantify the process of the left hand side to the right hand side. Next. Audit in different ways. Different audit compliances, some are really focused on group role permissions, and some are like SOX are very focused on who has, has access for that app. Why? Well, SOX is about financial reporting and you should know who has access to the, to the data and resource around financial reporting. That's why the UATS product lets you do it all the ways above. Next. Auto delegation. You wanna save hundreds of hours in the process? What you should do is say, okay, let me not figure out who the managers are and send them a report. Let me have the product auto delegate out to the managers. That's really, really saves time in the process. Next. Next, a little more. Multiple reviewers. Like I said, this actually goes in, you have to take a little, talk to the people on the right-hand side, talk to your auditors. And they say, if you really wanna do audit right, I shouldn't just have the line manager say, I approve this. I also should make that show awareness that the, uh, that the people who are in charge of the resource are also uh, good with these roles. And that's what this product does. It's kind of neat because what we've done in some formats is not only do this for the audit, but for the access request and access approvals. Next, auto scheduling. Well, um, here's, uh, here's what's going on in the world, right? I mean, so we know that certain things like socks, you know, it's, it's once a year, but then, then you have other uh, 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 regulations that are more like six months a year when I saw some recommendations of HIPAA. And now we see some recommendations for certain industries uh, from the CISA of, of the United States every month. Wouldn't it be nice, nice to auto schedule it? And that's what this product does. It automatically will send out those reports. Remember number one, auto attestation of the reports. That's what the product does. It sends them out and says, hey guys, here we go. And what's really cool, what Ty is gonna show you in the demo is we can click a little button that says, this is what it's due by. You know how humans work, they gotta have schedules. Next. One more, Ty will show this. Okay, um, timestamp reports, that's evidence that you actually did the review, right? So not only do we send these out, can be downloaded in, in spreadsheets for people to add notes or whatever, but more importantly, it can be created as a, as a timestamp PDF. One more. Keep going. This is worth a second. First of all, a state and time audit is also called a Delta audit. The product can do this, and this what saves literally for the large organizations hundreds of hours. Take a snapshot of your resource that you want to audit, be it AD, be it Okta, be it whatever, whatever you have, okay? 
Now, in 90 days, use the product again, you attest will automatically compare the two states. And then you say uh, gently to your auditor, okay, here's where the change is. And then the product automatically, automatically sends out those attestations to those managers and they approve it. That saves countless amounts of hours. Remember that little story I said about the left-hand side and right-hand story? That's what we got out of having the IT directors talk to the external auditors with us, you know, taking copious notes and heard him said, well, if you really want to save time in this, Garrett, do a Delta, do a time, time, time state and time audit, and then compare it and then automatically send out the reports. In fact, we're so proud of this feature. That's what Ty is going to show you. Rock and roll. Okay. All right, now what Every everyone's time. been waiting for, the quick demo from Tyab. I'm going to stop sharing and give the screen over to Tyab. Thank you, guys. Uh, I'm going to be sharing my screen. Give me one second. Okay, can you guys see my screen now? Yes. Okay, so this is the UATS dashboard. Once you're logged into UATS, this is what you will see. It will show you the total audits that you have in the system with the pending ones and the completed ones. And it will also categorize them accordingly if you have application audits, group audits, or event audits. So for the start, I'm gonna tell you a bit about our CSV audits. So to create one, you're just gonna head over to the CSV audits and click on create CSV audit. And inside, you're gonna be asked to put in a name for every single audit that you're gonna create. So it can easily identify. So for this one, let's just say I'm gonna perform an audit for Salesforce, right? So for this one, I'm gonna be selecting the due date. So what the due date does is, as Garrett was explaining earlier about the NAG reminders, so it actually helps you complete the audit in the given time and it actually generates reminders for the people who are responsible for that campaign or audit. So uh, they will be receiving different notifications from you. It has that, hey, you have a pending audit and it needs to be completed by this date. And after that, we're gonna select our source file, which is gonna be this one. And I'm gonna show you the file as well to see how simple it is. So it only has, as you can see right here, it only has username, first name, last name, and then email address, roles, and applications. You can only choose the ones that are relative for you. You don't have to input all of this information. You can just use first name, last name, and emails to create one. And our system will pick it up. No matter what you do, it will never fail to pick it up. It will always pick up your template. It will never say that the format isn't correct because we have an actual mapping field inside you attest. So whenever you upload a file, it will, be, it will ask you to map the field accordingly. And you're gonna select the names from right here in this tab. So for user ID, you're gonna select username, first name for first name, last name for last name, then username again for username. And if you see right here, we have an option to separate different roles. If a user has multiple roles, they can be separated in our application just by clicking on this check mark and you can enter this as roles for email, email. And last one is the manager's email address. So even after doing that, if you have some custom fields in your CSV, you can just input that right here and select accordingly. Our, our system will pick that CSV file up. So once you've completed mapping your fields, just remember you can actually save all of this mapping for future and you can simply select that again from right here in need uh, whenever you upload another CSV file and you don't want to map every file, every single file that you want to upload. So you can do that as well. So once you've done that, we're gonna click on create the audit. And once we've done that, our audit will be right here, we're gonna click on it to get inside and we're gonna see the same four users that I have in that CSV file with their additional information that I provided in that CSV file. The manager's email, person's email, their user ID. And so at this step, what you what UATS gives you is the opportunity to do 
to delegate this out to different people or the relevant people who are actually responsible for this uh, user. So how is that done? Let me show you. So it's pretty simple. What you have to do is click on this check mark and then click on the select actions button and click on delegate. So once you click on delegate, it will ask you to input the reviewer's email address or if you have multiple email addresses, you can actually do that too, two or three people at one time. Or if you wanna assign this to a group, for example, if this user belongs to the IT or the admin group, you can just type in the group name, it will pop up and you can select it from right here. Once done, you can click on assign. Or if you don't know who's the person responsible for this user and you think that the best possible solution is to assign their line manager to this task. So for that, we have this auto delegate feature and what the auto delegate feature does is, is pretty exciting. It actually sends out an email to the user's manager that's mentioned in his information and they will receive an email that they have to come in and attest or review this user's access or that user's access can be for the group or for the applications, whatever you stated, or for their roles. So they, will, they can come in easily inside UITAS and do that for you. Or let's just say for this example, I am the reviewer or I am the manager for all of these four users. And let's say I select these users and say that Yes, I certify their access. I think that they have the right access and I click on certify, I click on apply just to see what happens next. So once I've done that, as you can see that it has added some more information about the task that I just performed. It will show you my name, audit user. That just says audit user just because I'm logged in as audit user. Once you're logged in, it will show your name. It will also show you the action you just took as I certified them, it also shows that, and it will give you the timestamp of when this action was performed, which is pretty essential for this. And as it adds value to your audit, plus you don't even have to take a screenshot of all of this information, even at this point, you can simply download a report in any of the format you choose, or you can print it out because uh, normally people do this manually and they do not have an option to download a report. I understand that can be pretty hectic. And that's where UITAS comes in to make, make your lives a bit easier. And even when you're done attesting to a user, you can simply add a comment right here to why this user was rejected or certified for this application or data. So uh, let's just head back and try to create another uh, audit and I'll show you what a state in time looks like. So let's just say it is a comparison between two audits, one that was performed back in July and one that we're gonna perform right now for this month. So I'm gonna upload my file and I'm gonna click on next. As I showed you earlier, we can just use the mapping file right here. If that information is available in the CSV file, that will be automatically picked up. If not, that will be left. After that, as you can see right here, I have the option to run a comparison campaign. I'm just gonna click on this check mark, click create the audit. Once done, it will ask me to search the audit that I want. As I, you can see that it's right here, I will click on that and it will give me an option to see if I want to know that the user status has changed, if they have been added or removed, if their roles have been changed or any of the roles have been removed. So let's just say, I wanna see all of these. Let's say, I don't know what specifically changed and I wanna see what actually did. So let's click on create the audit. Once that is done, let's just head inside the audit. And once you do that, it will show you what actually changed over the, over the past six or three months. So. As you can see right here, it says that the, this user was removed from the system. This was also removed. This user is a new user in the system and these are also new users. This is all just by compar comparing a CSV file that you uploaded back in July to the new one that you uploaded right now. And then the best part is that 
there can then you can assign a reviewer for this task to get this campaign completed. For example, if you want to know why this user was removed or when this user was removed, who actually attested to this, or uh, now that the campaign has been generated, who's going to attest to it now? Uh, what is the protocol or the procedure for it? So you can actually assign a, the relevant person or the team to this task and they will attest to the user and give you a proper paper trail and documentation of all of this process. So that is the basics of how you're going to operate on new attest. And now I'm going to switch it back to Ashley. Thank you, Tayan. No problem. All right, now I'm going to go over the UATS functionality summary. So access reviews, they're application based, group based, and event based. As far as enterprise features, we have multiple admins and reviewers. We have auto scheduling. We have completion status and reminders. CSV support. We support any application or rule set. Go back. What makes you attest different? The time savings, it eliminates expensive manual processes, right? We're all busy, we all need to save time. We, this also creates compliance reports automatically, no more manual spreadsheets. The GUI is designed by auditors for the purpose of auditors, and we have no deployment costs, not a dollar. So what this shows is the product pays for itself in a single identity audit. Enterprise, enterprises run eight to 12 audits per year. So here's a little recap that you can see this, the cost savings. Yeah, let me emphasize that. And Ashley is 100% right. We haven't charged anything for uh, for deployments just because it's it's set up. Either you upload the CSV or use one of our connectors. And, you know, maybe some day we will. But I, I, it, we designed this to be the sales force of IGA products that you just set it up and use. So now more into the UATS pricing. So again, no deployment costs, but as you can see, we, we have great pricing. Um, if your user account is 500, $1.90, it just goes down from there depending on your user account. So very cost-effective versus other competitors. Um, we have SaaS pricing, again, unlimited applications, unlimited reports, unlimited delegations. You can easily subscribe. All you need is credit card. Uh, we have full support of all features added in 2021. And just to add on to that, we're very flexible. So, you know, even if you try the 30 day trial, there's some, some things that you want to add. Uh, we're more than happy to work with you. We're, we're able to do that. And what do we love, Ashley? We love feature requests. We do. We love <laughs> exactly flexibility. We, we, we love making people's lives easier. Yeah, there we do. We, the product lives and breathes off the feature requests. All right, do we take a few questions? Absolutely. So I have some questions here. Uh, first one I'm going to ask, I'm going to direct it over to Paul. Uh, how many hours does a VC so usually do a week for a customer? Uh, so from a week standpoint, it varies. So typically, the my clients will end up buying a bucket of hours for a month. Uh, and then that's how they consume it in a monthly. It's not per se from a week perspective, it's more at a monthly level. Uh, and there's typically a small, medium and large, you know, some of my larger clients want 30 hours a month. Some of them only one 15, some of them one eight. Uh, generally in most cases, VCSOs are pretty flexible, but they normally have a small, medium and large bucket of hours dedicated on a monthly basis. Okay, another one for you, Paul. Are VCSOs usually certified? And if so, with what? Yes, so VCSOs, there is a special certification. You can actually be a certified as a Chief Information Security Officer. It's through EC Council. Uh, but there's also a host of other information security, uh, cybersecurity uh, certifications out there. And most VCSOs hold multiple uh, certifications, just like myself on my introductory slide, I have five or six certifications. I'm a certified incident handler. Uh, I have a CISSP, a certified information security manager. I'm a certified chief information security officer uh, and so forth. 
Thank you. Garrett, I'm really curious about this. So how long does a UATS take to deploy? Everyone's busy. How long does it take? The best part of my career was when a, a CISO, someone in Paul's uh, position, called me a liar. <laughs> and it's true because he did a reference call. And we encourage reference calls, talk to our customers. Um, and, and, and the person said um, they had a, uh, I think it was in that case, an Okta connector. And it said, then the person said, data was about 10 minutes. And then we, you know, we, we got our SE out and he did the install for, for the CISO. And the CISO did the hands-on. He just guided them. And it was three minutes. He goes, well, I have to call you a liar, Garrett, because it, it was a, it, your customer told me it was 10 minutes. That's literally what it takes it, it, with, with our connector, or we can go in and do our CSV upload, which is really popular for uh, every customer uses them because you're doing it today. You're already exporting the data. Why wouldn't you just take it and put it up in, in our, our cloud and let all those features? So there you go. Um, you know, 10 minutes uh, to, to a half hour for the uh, for the Okta. And then what we do, we show you how to use it. That's that's really what it is. But but the actual implementation and getting the data in is is always under 10 minutes. OK. Paul, so with the emergence of VC SOs, uh, how many clients does a VC so usually have? Uh, so it depends because. You know, from a VC so perspective, uh, a fair amount of my clients at some point want somebody internal to take over that function or mentor or something along those lines where I'll still be involved, but they'll take more onus and ownership internal to the company. So it does vary, but um, from, from like an hour's perspective, I can generally run, you know, six to 10 clients uh, at a time only because some are onboarding and some are offboarding because some of them want to take ownership over. And, you know, that hours chart, you might start out at 30 hours a month for maybe the first year, but then you tailor down to 12 and then to eight to four. And eventually somebody internal to the company is actually taking ownership of cyber and actually is going to lead that effort going forward where the program is built and developed and, and they can just run and maintain. So it just, it, it really does vary just based off of that. Sounds good. Ty, I have a question for you. Can you attest uh, deploy or can we audit legacy on-premise apps? Is that, does that work? Yeah, it does work. Uh, basically we can use the PowerShell script uh, to pull information from any source data uh, for, so, as long as it's in a CSV file or an Excel file, we can pull in the information and uh, we can perform audits off of that. Sounds yeah. good. And, and, and Tyab does it all the time. Perfect. So let's check the chat real quick and see. Perfect. Just wanted to check if we have any other questions and we are good. So any other questions? Um, we have info at uatest.com. Here's our phone number. Uh, here's our contacts. Garrett Tayab shares our product manager. Again, Paul with H2 Cyber. Uh, I apologize. I didn't introduce myself. My name is Ashley Madison. I'm the customer success manager. So any questions, please feel free, to, feel free to reach out to us. Thank you for your time. Thank you. And thank you, Paul. Great stuff. Yeah, today. no, appreciate it. Thanks, Garrett, Ashley, Tayab. Uh, much appreciated. Thanks for having me on your webinar. Okay. Thank you. Have a great day, all. Take care, everybody. Bye, guys. Bye. Bye.